day with a little teaching. A different word every day. So this particular day, it was quite a while ago now, around the turn of coming into this new year, was joy. And, everyone, and I thought to myself, joy, everyone loves to have joy. And Christmas is about joy. And we say, oh, have a joyous new year. And so you heard him say that joy is a choice. And so I thought I'd just share that with you this morning, along with this, that kind of what ties into what I've been sharing with you starting last Sunday. Choices, choices, choices. Just as joy is a choice, there are other things in life that are a choice as well, that we choose. So, Father, I pray. Let's stand together one more time. Lord, I pray that as your word is declared this morning, that you would indeed enlighten our hearts. God, I pray once again for life transformation as we talk about choices, choices, choices. Every day we make choices. So God, I pray that by your spirit, you would empower us. Amen. You can take your seats. So last Sunday, I began the series on the believer's Management of the affairs of his and her life. Colossians chapter 3, verses 2 and 3 says, Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden in Christ, with Christ in God. Set your minds on things that are above. Death brings life in Christ. As a result, our whole life should be transformed and changed. This is the church in Colossae. Paul is saying, set your minds because you have died and you're hidden in Christ. So that means there should be transformation that is seen every day of our lives. That means every day of our lives, there are choices to be made. Suddenly, because there is new life in Jesus, our philosophy of life changes. Our purpose in life changes. Our priorities in life changes. Our values in life changes. Our minds are set on heaven. And when our minds are set on heaven, everything changes around about us. Last Sunday, I looked at, I'll call it the Christian life management. You choose the pattern. I gave you the pattern. I gave you some models and gave you four options. Number one, you can do little with much. Number two, you can do much with little. Number three, you can do little with little. Number four, you can do much with much. And I said the answer sheet is number two. Pick number two or pick number four. They're reaching out saying, pick me, pick me, pick me. Number two or number four. Number two is you can do much with little. Number four is you can do much with much. These are the new life in Jesus models. These are a result of our minds that are set upon heavenly things in Christ Jesus. This is a result of being hidden in Christ. We're with him. So today, I, I want to talk to you on this subject. I'm going to title it this way. You choose the church. Last week, you choose the pattern or model. So this morning, you choose choose the church. Did you know that you are the ones that decide what kind of a church Calvary Temple will be? Here's what I know. All church people have church wants. All church people have church wants. Whatever kind of church you want this church to be, you must be. Whatever kind of church you want this church to be depends upon you. Now, if you're a guest this morning, I'm speaking about those that regularly attend this church. They would call this church their home church. That it depends upon you. For the Bible says, you are the church. If you want a friendly church, you must be friendly. If you want a financially giving and generous church, you need to be giving and generous. If you want a praying church, you need to pray. If you want a missions church, you need to be a missions person. 
If you want a church that reaches out, you must reach out. If you want a caring church, you need to care. If you want a ministry to people and needs, you need to be involved. Isn't it true? Sometimes church people say, if only they had a ministry for that. You are the church. And if you want that kind of a ministry, you be involved. You stand up and say, I'll do it. I want to serve God. I want that to be the part of the church. If you want a better sermon on Sunday, you need to pray. And amen, that little guy. You need to pray and say, God, help him. God, help him. See, whatever you want Calvary Temple to be, you need to be. You need to be. You are the church. You actually choose the church. Now, as you and I choose the church, let me give you some great, great church models. There's a model in the Bible that just blows me away. Three churches. And I want to set those before you as models, just as Paul set those models before the Corinthian church. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 to 5. Chapter 8 of 2 Corinthians, verse 1. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God also to us. Wow. That, isn't that an astounding passage of Scripture? Paul was saying, speaking to the Corinthian church, and he said, I want you to know the guts and the heart of these Macedonian churches. Why? Because Paul wanted to exhort them. He wanted to exhort them by hearing of these great role models. Well, who are these great Role models. These, who were these churches? There was a church in Philippi. It was a church in Thessalonica. And it was a church in Berea. And Paul the Apostle sets them in front of the Corinthian church. I want to expose you to them and their ministry and who they are. Keep in mind, the church is people. When I say church, I'm talking about people. Paul is speaking about a time when when he appealed to these churches and asked for some financial aid for relief help for the saints in Jerusalem and Judea. And so they generously gave. And Paul wanted to encourage the Corinthian church to have the same generosity. In fact, the Corinthian church began to give generously as well to this particular need, but for some reason, and we could go into that, but it's a whole different sermon, for some reason they stopped. And so a year later, Paul appeals and speaks with the Corinthian church and says, hey guys, hey church, would you please finish what you began? You started well. You were generous. You were giving, but you stopped. And as we look at these Macedonian churches in Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, we discover a great, great formula for any church to use. Here it is. Right attitude plus right action equals the blessing of God. Right attitude plus right action equals the blessing of God. 
And I just pray this would inspire you because in the brand new year, there's brand new decisions to make. That's why we're talking about stewardship and, and uh, lordship. In a brand new year, there's new decisions because everybody wants to follow God. And many, as church people, want to do our very, very best to follow him. And we want to make decisions in light of what God's word says to us. And so the beginning of a new year, we say we're going to chart a new course. And so we're talking about stewardship and, and choices. So let's talk about the right attitudes. Attitude is everything. Attitude is everything. Maybe I should get you to say that with me because I want to hear you say it. Let's say it together. Attitude is everything. Can I give you a staggering and bewildering attitude? I'm going to call this attitude number one. It just blows my little mind. It's found in 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 2. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty wound up in rich generosity. Is that not a staggering and bewildering attitude? In the midst of a very severe trial. Now, in the midst of a very, very severe trial, I could think of another way that we could end that particular verse. Let me end it this way. In the midst of a very severe trial, their joy ceased to flow, and their extreme poverty welled up to create pure selfishness. Isn't that one way it could end? And the devil would sit back and just <laughs> applaud it. Applaud it. I want your joy to stop. I want you to be selfish. I want you to withhold. I want you to hold back. I want you to think of yourself. Way to go. It could be that way, but it wasn't. This was not just a trial. But the Bible says this was a very severe trial. This was not just poverty, but the Bible says it was an extreme poverty. Can I break it down? They were experiencing affliction. These churches, Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea, facing adversity, facing calamity, facing famine, starvation, hardship, shortage. I even woke up a baby this morning. I'm, a, I'm just amazing. I don't want to let anybody sleep in church. <laughs> I love little ones. I love little children. And so here they were. They're experiencing scarcity and lack, and yet their joy flowed over the cup, and they were rich in generosity. So I scratched my little my short little, through my short little hair to my head, and I scratch this, and I say to myself, either this body of believers were completely insane and went off the deep end, or maybe they heard from God. Or maybe they were just, had the world's best attitude. Maybe. And possibly, probably, and hopefully, we can present this as a great, Model, attitude, attitude, attitude. Attitude is everything. Now, I would imagine if I was to ask you for a raise of hands, there'd be people here that could raise their hands and say, I've got a problem. There might be some that could raise their hand and say, I'm up to my waist in problems. I imagine there might be some here this morning that have experienced shortfalls setbacks, financially speaking, in other ways. What are the temptations when you go through difficulties? When you go through financial setbacks or problems or mountains trying to climb, situations and trials, the temptations are to pull back, pull in, lash out, anger, and a focus on me. And if we're not mindful, Remember what Paul said? Set your minds on things above. And if we're not mindful of heavenly things, if we're not spiritually alert, we can allow our problems to keep us from being good managers. It can color our giving. 
It can taint our perspective. It can rob our joy. But you see, a right attitude, it says, I refuse to allow my trials and the poverty to stop me from overflowing with joy and generosity. I refuse. Attitude is a choice. I choose not to allow that to happen. So here are these churches being great managers, making great choices amidst challenges. It's because the attitude of the people was also the attitude of the church because the church was the people. That's a very, very staggering, staggering, bewildering attitude, number one. This is another one in here. Another staggering and bewildering attitude kind of makes me dizzy. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 4. Where is it? It says here, and they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. That is a staggering, dizzying attitude. These churches pleaded, and they begged Paul, Paul, let us give. But you read it there. There's more before that that sets the stage even where, whereby this was their attitude. Paul, let us have the privilege of being generous. Paul, we want to bless others. Paul, we want to dig deep into our pockets and our wallets and our purses. Paul, let us give more offerings. Have you ever in your life heard of a church where the people stood up and said, please, pastor, please receive another offering? I've been in pastoring 35 years. No one's ever said that. Or how about this one? Please, just 10 more offerings. Please, just 10 more offerings. Can we just receive 10 more offerings to the kingdom? Hmm. Urgently, begging. I want to, I want to, I get to. It's a privilege. I love Warren Wearsby, reading his commentaries and his books. He, He's an incredible writer. Can I read to you what he says? He tells this story. He says, the preacher, about somebody. The preacher says, I should give until it hurts, said a miserly church member. But for me, it hurts just to think about giving. Isn't that comical? It's funny, but it's not. It's funny, but it's really not. I love watching Barrett, ja Barrett Jackson Jackson auctions. I had the privilege of attending one in the fall in Las Vegas, October. And recently they were just in Scottsdale, five days. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I believe, for seven days, entire week. Tape them all, watch them all. What amazes me about these auctions is the company. They are so supportive of charitable organizations. And they give people an opportunity to be charitable. And they say, the next car coming up on the block to be auctioned off. And they have people that come up and stand representing a charity. And every dollar that comes in is going to this charity. Generosity. And I've even seen the lead, the, oh, what's his name? Mr. Barrett. He even kind of breaks down because he's moved by, with emotion about being generous. He's all going to go to charity, and so it's not uncommon for the bidder to start. I always want to be an auctioneer. Give me five, 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 ten, ten over here, ten, fifteen over here. Anyways, they raise money, sold, and it's not uncommon for that person to stand up and say, "Sell it again." And so they sell the car again, and all the money raised goes to that charity again. Generosity. Is exploding and people just explode with giving and I find myself saying, but the church, but Jesus people, <laughs> but people that are know the gift of salvation and are born again and know they're on the way to heaven and have their minds set upon heavenly things ought to be the most generous people in the whole wide world. I just believe that. I just think that that is what is in the Bible. If our minds are set upon he heavenly things, Christians and believers 
ought to be liberal in their giving. For spirituality should equal generosity. It's just the right attitude. An attitude is a choice. So, let's go to the second one. Not just the right attitude, but the right action of this, these amazing churches. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 5. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves, first of all, to the Lord. Then, by the will of God, also to us. These three churches. Right attitudes and right actions. Have you ever noticed they kind of tend to work on each other? They lift each other. They, they kind of soar together. They work together like, like the two wings of an eagle on an eagle or an airplane. These church people did not first give themselves to the flesh, but first they gave themselves to the Lord. They died and they were hidden in Jesus. They were walking dead people. They were not zombies, but they were walking dead people. They were true, genuine followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were Christian, not in just word, but in action. The lordship issue was settled in their lives. His image is stamped on me. God is number one. He's in control of my life. He owns everything. I just keep falling in love with him over and over and over again. Now, when I fell in love with Lana, and when we were married, I want you to know that my whole life changed. Everything changed. I wanted to be around my wife. I wanted to please my wife. I wanted to make her laugh. I wanted to pick up my clothes. Oh, it hurts when you laugh like that. I wanted to build a nice home. I still remember building our home out on Grand Valley Road, and we stood. I still know we were standing, and my wife was so happy standing in the living room. Oh, Gary, it's going to be so beautiful and wonderful, and we embraced. Oh, marvelous. The rest is done your business. What happened after that? We necked. That's so old. That saying is so old. I just tell you, my life changed. Such a marvelous way. It continues to change. I do not do the dishes. Put them in the dishwasher, press the button. I do the dishes. I sacrifice for her. I go to craft stores. I go shopping with her and come out with nothing. Because that's what ladies do. They go on shopping sprees, sprees, and they come out with nothing. That's what they do, don't they? What I'm saying is when you got saved, you were changed. But when you gave your life to your spouse, something happened, and you were different. When you got saved, that's a terminology of some people, you got saved? But when you got saved, you didn't get religion. I say it all the time, you got a relationship. Not religion. That pizza we had last night, Lana, really dries you out the next day. Man. Note to self, Saturday, no pizza. Did we have Saturday pizza yesterday? Anyways, what day is this? It's too cold, my brain's froze. So Jesus invited you and I to fall in love with him. To keep falling in love with Jesus over and over and over again. He invites us. Out of the actions that we show and portray sometimes confuses and confounds the world because our actions are so different. You are then called to begin Heavenly mindset, living management. I don't know how else to put it. You are called to explode with generosity and giving. 
give your talents, to give your gifts, to give your abilities, to give your time, to give to help the needy, to give to other ministries. Loretta Nelson, when she thanked Calvary Temple last Sunday morning, what a joy that it felt inside because of she was sharing, thank you for being generous. Thank you for your giving. CT was generous because you were generous because you are the church. So when you fall in love with Jesus, let me move into the element of tithing. 10% of your income is an honor. And so let me explain in case some of you not, don't realize this, that the tithe that you give to Calvary Temple goes to the general fund of this church to cover the expenses of operating this ministry. R.T. Kendall, in his book on tithing, says, tithing is the solution that no one talks about. Why? It needs to be taught, and it needs to be caught. I remember my first church. I was young, I was inexperienced, and, and, and I remember going to my first gathering where all the pastors got together in our section. And I stood up and I testified. And I said, I want you to know that I, I launched out into the deep and I preached on tithing last Sunday. I was so fearful. But listen, it's got to be taught. It's in the Bible, generosity and giving. And R.T. Kendall says it's the solution that nobody talks about. We need to talk about it. We do need to talk about it. It frees and liberates the church to fly and do great things for God. You choose the church. I give them financially to the Lord and his church is only painful and grievous if one, does not first, if one has not first given themselves to God. Then it's like paying taxes. Then it's like paying bills. Then it's like paying credit cards. Then it's like paying house mortgages and car loans and car insurance. And I don't, Jump for joy when I pay my taxes. But I do when I get to bring the tithe into the storehouse. I give a great expectancy. It is God's. I honor the Lord. I believe in God. I believe in the church. I believe in the ministries. I believe that God has called us to be generous and give to his kingdom. So when People first have not given themselves to God. They negotiate with him. God, I did this. This should cancel out some of the tithe. Is that not true? Or if they haven't first given themselves to the Lord, they justify and rationalize. Well, God knows the situation. What does he expect? Or thirdly, they scheme. Oh, how can I work it out so that I can give the bare minimum to God? How can I just work it out so ho, 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 it's not Christmas, but it's not Santa, but ho, 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 hold everything. Can we say it together? John chapter 3 and verse 16. Let's say it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Aren't you grateful? That God did not hold back for you. I'm so glad that God did not withhold his son. And I'm so glad that Jesus gave up his life for us. And in return, I'm asked, how much do you love me? God looks at me and says, how much do you love me? How much do you love my work? How much do you love my kingdom? How much do you love what I'm doing? How much do you love the ministry? How much do you love reaching people for the Lord Jesus Christ? What am I willing to do? What am I willing to give? After the last Sunday morning service, Pastor Vern came to me and told me about a little child in kids' church that he overheard running to his mommy, and said, Mommy, 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 guess what? Jesus loves me. That's what they're teaching down there, Jesus. And then Pastor Vern told me that 
He said, oh, it touched my heart when I saw a little one, a little boy, as we're singing worship songs in the lower auditorium with his hands out like this, eyes closed, praising God. That's what we're doing. Kids' ministry. What a marvelous ministry in this church. That's just one example. You're choosing this church to have an incredible children's ministry. It's your choice. Just an example of one of the wonderful ministries of Calvary Temple. So these churches, they had the right actions. They first gave themselves to the Lord. And when you first give yourself to the Lord, things will change. But secondly, they also, Paul says, gave themselves to us. 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 5. See, it was not just a lordship issue. It was a people issue. Not just upways surrender, but it was sideways surrender. Churches are people that matter to the Lord, and therefore they matter to us. So I encourage you, give yourself away to each other. Love on each other. Help each other. Bless each other. Serve each other. Pray for each other. Do good to each other. You see, you choose the church. You choose the kind of church it'll be. When we honor each other and pray for each other and uplift each other and bless each other and encourage. And when you're in conversation with one another, sometimes you got to bite your tongue and say, I'm not going to talk about me. Because sometimes in conversations, someone says something, we don't listen, and we just blurt out with, Something about my life. Listen intently. Listen to what they're saying. Care for each other. You choose the church. And then when guests and visitors walk through the doors, they say, oh, what a loving, friendly, marvelous, generously church that is. I want to be a part of this church. I see the generosity. I see the care. You choose the church. One last point. It's very short. Right attitudes and right actions produce the blessing, the blessing of the Lord. As Paul is encouraged in the Corinthians to be all that God intends the church to be, he says, note what is happening in the churches of Macedonia. Chapter 8 and verse 1. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. The grace that is being poured out in that church. In those churches, those three churches, I should say. The grace. They're experiencing the grace of God. God is extending his grace. You see, right attitudes plus right actions equals the blessings of God It touched and reached and permeated every person in the church, and therefore it was described as a grace-filled church. We're nothing without his grace. We're lost without his grace. We can't do anything without his grace. I preached a sermon one time, I believe it was, to the seniors at a care home facility. It might have been Valley View. And I said, you have got a brand new seat. And I talked about Ephesians chapter 2, where you're saved by faith. You're lifted up, and you sit now in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. There's nothing like the grace of God that fills the church to overflowing. Saved by grace. Touched by grace. Healed from affliction and adversity and pains by the grace of God given purpose by the grace of God, given energy to make it through the dark hours by the grace of Almighty God. Grace, grace, God's marvelous grace. So this morning as I close, you choose the church. Whatever church, whatever you want this church to be, you must first be. 
Whatever you want this church to be depends upon you. And sometimes we do this, but there's a few more pointing back. Whatever I want, I've got to be. You choose the church. It's all about choices, 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 choices. Let's stand together. God, I thank you. I thank you for power. I thank you for the precious Holy Spirit. I thank you for the grace that we experience within these walls. Thank you for the grace that permeates this congregation. I thank you, God, for the incredible future. Where people need the Lord, and we get to be a part of it. Help us, God. Help us. Help us to make good choices in light of our minds being set upon heavenly things. Help us, God. We want to be our very, very best. Sometimes we fail. Sometimes we falter. Sometimes we trip. But God, we want to be our best. We want to see this world one to you. We want to see our city transformed and Therefore, we need to be good examples. And so God, in this new year, may we set brand new priorities in our lives. Amen. As we sing a song this morning, if you're here and you say, i just like to just stand before the Lord and give it all to Him. Maybe you'd, you'd say, I'd just like to come and stand before the altar. And just say, I give you my all, God. It's a lordship issue. I give you my all. If you want to do that, it's very fitting as we sing. You just come and stand. And you say, it's all to Jesus I surrender. If you want to do that, we welcome you. And then I'll close in prayer. We are a